You may be seated. Have your Bibles with you. If you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to John chapter 11 as we continue our look through John. If you're using the blue Bible there in the underneath in the seat in front of you, there you will be on page 1143. 1143 in the blue Bible is there in the seat in front of you. You know, last week uh, we saw Jesus do something that no man could ever do. No, no prophet of the Lord before him. No man in and of himself could ever do. Jesus raised a man who had been dead four days, and he raised him to new life. It was the last and arguably the greatest miracle that Jesus performed in his public ministry before he then went away to spend his last days with his disciples in teaching them before he came to Jerusalem again. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word uh, and every uh, word of it is true and that it is without error, that it is uh, true and right in everything that it teaches us. Father, we pray now that you would uh, open the hearts and the ears and the minds of everyone here today including myself, Lord, that you would open my mouth to declare your word aright. Father, we pray that your spirit would do this all to the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so it is in his name that we ask this. Amen. John chapter 11, beginning at verse 45, and we will read to the end of the chapter. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus had done believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees assembled the Sanhedrin and said, What shall we do? This man is performing many signs. If we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation." Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, that the whole nation should not perish. He did not say this on his own authority, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only but for, that he might also gather together in unity the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day forward, they planned to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim and remained there with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Many went up to Jerusalem from the country before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they searched for Jesus and said among themselves as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. This is God's holy word. Amen. John here is explaining something for us that we would not necessarily see for ourselves if we were standing here. If we were just beholding the events, we would not necessarily understand all the implications of what's going on here. And so John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and being taught by Jesus himself, he explains for us. See, there's the twofold purpose of God in the miracles that Jesus did. And especially this last miracle that we just heard of last week, where Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead after four days. See, these 
this twofold purpose that God has in the miracles is that they not only display God's power and His sovereign control over all His creation and thus prove who Christ is, who, who He was to those who witnessed the miracles. He is the Son sent from the Father. But they also serve as a, an example, a, a visual example of the Word of Christ. That's why John, throughout all of his gospel, Jesus says something about himself, and then he performs a miracle to show it, to demonstrate the truth of what he just said. So Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the light. And then he proceeds to raise Lazarus from the dead. It's the word in action. And we know that God's word is a, a two-edged sword. It's sharper than, than anything else. And it divides. It divides, uh, in, the, in Hebrews, Paul tells us it, it divides all the way down to the very heart of who you are, of who a person is. And so we see that this miracle of Jesus and all his miracles, they serve to either confirm the faith of his people or confirm the rejection of those who do not believe in him, who refuse to believe. See, John's been telling us of this phenomenon from the very beginning of Jesus's ministry. Jesus would would say a word, he would explain who he is, he would perform a miracle, and each and every time some would believe, and then we see that others would do other, otherwise. They would not believe, but they would act. They would do something in contradistinction to belief. See, the resurrection of Lazarus filled some who saw it with awe with gratitude. And so we say we see that John tells us that they believe in Christ. Now, you know, you and I may not have been able to see that. But John tells us that this is true. That they believe in Jesus. They came to worship him as he is the resurrection and the life. And yet others we see in this passage others Jesus's miracles fills them with ingratitude, with unbridled opposition to him, hatred of who he is and what he was there to do. And so John tells us some go straight away to the Pharisees in order to enter into a plot to be rid of Jesus once and for all. See, remember John's purpose in telling us all these things. It's so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing in him, you would have eternal life. He's not just speaking to the unbelievers that you might believe in him. He's speaking to you and I that we might believe in him. Remember, John shows us over and over in his gospel, to believe Christ. It's not this idea that, that many today have that it's what, you know, they ask the question, do you believe in God? Well, sure. Yeah, sure, I believe in God. I live like I want to live. I don't really care. I mean, I'll just leave him alone. But yeah, I believe in him. Even our brother James, uh, in the book of James, he says, the demons believe and they shudder. He's saying that's not what belief is. Belief is trusting him, entrusting your entire life to him. It has evidence that can be uh, 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 appealed to, that can be seen. Belief has evidence. It's not just locked up in my head. It's not just something I pull out. On Sunday, yeah, I believe. See, here's my belief card. No, it is 
It's how you live. Now, how often do we see the Lord work in our own lives? Time and time again. We who say we believe. He answers prayer for provision. He answers your prayers for strength in the midst of trial and difficulty. He he answers our prayer for words to speak when we just don't know what to say. And and we want to share what, what Jesus has done for us. And then on another day, we're faced with a brand new challenge. (laughs) And we don't trust him. I don't think he can do this. I'm not sure that he can help me through this problem. Sure, he's helped me through all those others. But I don't know about this one. See, instead, we plot and we scheme about how we will take care of things. And our mind begins to create backup plans just in case Jesus doesn't show up when you want him to. So I've got plan B and I've got plan C and I've got everything plotted out and planned out. All the while your heart and your actions deny what you should know to be true. And the only truth that matters in that situation in in all of our life is that Jesus is the Son who has come to give life. He has promised everything you need for life, for godliness. And He has promised that He will never leave or forsake you. But see, we're afflicted with that unbelief. We just don't Believe that Jesus is all in all. Oh, sure, He's the Savior. Oh, sure, He forgives me my sin. When I ask Him, usually He comes through. He's pretty reliable. But we don't truly believe that in His sovereign care over us, He always does what will bring him the most glory and you the most good. And so we plot and scheme to try to secure ourselves, to try to strengthen ourselves. See, is God not true to his word? Is Jesus not the faithful high priest in God's house forever? See, let us not fail to give him the glory and the honor that is due to his name alone. That he is all in all. That he is the son who brings life. And what we see from this is a very ugly picture of that sin that every unbeliever is afflicted with in unbelief, in not trusting in Christ. And yet it warns us, believer, that you continue to struggle with this. You continue to be afflicted by this unbelief on some level, in some area of your life. We read in verse 47, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees assembled the Sanhedrin and said, What shall we do? What what shall we do? Like, as if they had the power to thwart the decrees of God. As if they could do something that would squelch the works of the Son of God. As if they could harness the power of the Spirit and direct it in which direction they want it to go. See, this is the mindset of natural man. See, natural man says, I can do as I please. I can do whatever I please. And this prideful opposition to God's sovereignty, it rarely breaks out in full-scale rebellion all at once. And this is the warning for you and I. Rather, as we see in the Gospel of John, 
it grew in steps. Little by little. And then it reared its ugly head against Christ's rule. Little by little. See, John shows us over and over, the Jews held the pretense of being God's people. But they had no evidence to confirm this fact. Jesus says to them, if you were of my father, then you would believe in me. But you're not of my father. You're not my people. They knew that Christ was sent from God. Their own testimony shows this to be true. We read in the latter half of verse 47 and 48, this man is performing many signs. Do not be mistaken what they mean by that. They see clearly what Jesus is doing. He is performing many signs, many miracles, many wonders, many works. And then they go on to say, because we see that he's performing many signs, if we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Leave him alone. <laughs> they are so convinced that it is in their power to block the works of Jesus. To block His path. To keep Christ from accomplishing all that the Father had sent Him to do. And what was, what was that? Well, Jesus has already shed light on that. He's already told us a little bit about this, but in the Gospel of John, he leaves it until the very end. But we know that Jesus had been sent from the Father, as he told us back in chapter 3, that he was given by the Father to be that sacrifice for his people. Peter tells us on the day of Pentecost that this all happened according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. It does not mean, for, do not under, misunderstand foreknowledge. It does not mean that God just looked down through time and saw what was going to happen. That's why Peter says, according to the definite plan, the definite decree, the definite command for what God plans comes to pass. What He decrees always comes to pass. And so the Father had decreed that He would go in this manner. And so Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, prophesied, as John tells us, without even any understanding in and of Himself. But out of the evil intentions of his heart, he is used of the Holy Spirit to speak the words that Jesus has already told us would happen. And none of this is a surprise. And John is making this clear to you. There is no surprises here. This was the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. See, little by little, their words show their true hearts. See, if they thought that Christ was a fake, if they didn't understand, they were just ignorant of who He was, it would be their duty as the Pharisees, as the, the leaders of God's people, to work against Him. But see, their words betray their own hearts. This man is performing many signs. If we leave him alone, God forbid what will happen. See, they have no care for God or for His will. And little by little, they strive against God and His decree for the salvation of His people. Why are they so set against Jesus and His work? Because they fear the consequences of acknowledging Him to be the Son of God. To be the Lord. 
the Savior of His people. They say it. Their own words betray it. What if the Romans come? What if they take away everything that we have? Everything that we're holding on to? Until finally Caiaphas utters the most wicked of all schemes that have ever been hatched. And he says in verse 49 and 50, Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, that the whole nation should not perish. See, the only way for Caiaphas and for the Jews to deal with God and his son is to be rid of him. Caiaphas, as the high priest, utters the blackest of all schemes and literally says we must slay an innocent man. They have so little fear of God that they devise their own scheme in direct opposition to the very law of God. But they betray their motivations. For Caiaphas confidently believes that they will prosper in spite of provoking God's holy wrath. See, they just don't believe that God is who He says He is. That He will judge all wickedness. And that He has set His King upon His holy hill. And so the nations rage against that King. See, you and I struggle with this even though we have embraced Christ by the faith that has been given to us because we see Him for who He is. And we can but do nothing but love and adore Him. And yet we still wrestle and fight His work in our life. But we don't want to be seen as fighting against God. So instead, we, we fight with one another. We fight against our circumstances. I don't like this situation that you have placed me in, Lord. I don't believe that you really know what you're doing here. I need to take control here. I need to plan and plot and be confident to believe that I will prosper no matter what you say. See, Jesus, he foretold and explained this entire scenario in his parable of the vine growers. See, he, it says he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, and he let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came... He sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. But he said this to explain how he has taken the kingdom away from the Jews and given it 
to others, to those who would believe in the beloved Son. But what of we who have come to embrace Christ by faith? What about us when we see the Lord who is looking for fruit in our lives? And so he places us in a situation that tests us, that, that tries us. When we encounter sickness, when we encounter trouble at our job, when we come up against uh, difficulties in our relationship, that brother that just drives you crazy, that, that thing that the husband does that drives the wife crazy over and over and over. And we say in, our, in ourselves, I must do something about this. What shall I do? If I let this go on, what might happen? What consequences might come upon me? See now, we must see that for those of us who have been converted to Christ by faith, it's, it's wickedness to consult about guarding against dangers. Dangers that you cannot avoid unless you choose to turn your back on the path that Christ has set you upon. Unless you choose to do your will instead of submitting to His will. See, our first thought should be in every situation, what does God command? And what does He choose to be done in my life? See, by this you ought to live, whatever the consequences may be. We're all about calculating the risk. Because at the end of the day, we, we want to save our own skin whether that is our pride, whether that is our, our, our safety, whether that is our security. I want to feel secure. See, these men, on the other hand, they resolve that Christ shall be removed from the midst of them so that they will not be inconvenienced by allowing Him to fulfill His mission that the Father sent him to fulfill. But see, they did, not, they did not consider if we do this, if we banish a prophet of God from among them just to purchase peace with the Romans, just to make our lives more convenient, just to hold on to our power and my little kingdom, what shall become of us? What shall become of us? See, these are the schemes of those who do not truly and sincerely fear God. And you and I fall into that still in our hearts, in our minds. What is right and lawful according to God's law at those moments give us no concern. But our whole attention is directed to the consequences. What happens if I leave Christ alone in my life and let Him do His work? What if I trust Him? What consequences will befall me? See, the only way to consider your situation in a proper in a holy manner, is to first to inquire, what is your will, O oh God? And then to follow boldly wherever he leads. Not to be discouraged by any fear. Though we are threatened with a thousand deaths, as one commentator says, our actions must not be moved. 
but we must constantly be regulated by the word and will of God alone. When you boldly despise dangers or at least rise above them, and you, and you neglect your fears, and you sincerely obey God, you will at the end have a prosperous result. It may very well likely not be the result that you would have chosen. For contrary to all your fears, God blesses that firmness which is founded on obedience to His Word. See, believer, you need to cease striving. You need to lay down your vain plots and plans. Cease trying to gain and hold on to control of everything in your life. We're called to rest in the work of Christ. To rest in Him alone. To surrender all to Him. Because He truly is a Savior who truly saves His people from everything that afflicts us. That great affliction of unbelief. I just don't believe that the Lord is going to come through in this case. But come through, He will. We must surrender to Him. The only other option is to go down the road that John paints the picture for us. The life of unbridled striving against God. Of unbelief that leads to the road of destruction. It's a warning, but it's a comfort. Because He will keep you. He will. He, he earnestly, jealously yearns for the Spirit that He has placed in you. And He who began a good work in you will keep you until the day of Christ Jesus. Let us submit to His work in our lives, His will for us, willingly, gladly. Let us give Him the fruit that the Father is yearning for by the work of His Spirit in us. Amen. Let's pray.